You're listening to the Tech Bytes podcast from the Packet Pushers, a 15-minute conversation approximately at the intersection of technology and business. Our focus today is a real-world SDN deployment, and we're talking with John Tabaco. He is Director of IT Infrastructure for PM Pediatrics, a healthcare provider with offices across the United States. Uh, PM Pediatrics is a Fortinet customer, and Fortinet is our sponsor for this show. Uh, So, John, welcome to the program. Can you tell us briefly about PM Pediatrics? Absolutely. Hello, everybody. PM Pediatrics is the nation's largest urgent care for pediatrics, uh, children up to age 26. We are all across the nation, and we're typically on Main Street, USA, in a small brick-and-mortar type location. Okay, so the idea is if folks have some kind of emergency, they can just sort of walk in and get treatment for their kids. Absolutely. We're open noon to midnight every day, most major cities, and currently 60 locations, and we're hoping to get to 100 uh, over the next year or so. Okay, so a lot of locations, a lot of connectivity needs, I'm sure. What drove you to SD-WAN generally and then Fortinet's secure SD-WAN solution specifically? The locations that existed when I came on board back in 2018 were Cisco 1900 routers and a Netgear switch, which really wouldn't cut it for modern day security and mm. protecting resources inside. So adding a, a high cost circuit would, would definitely be my first choice because that's what I've done before. But in this case, I was pretty excited to keep the broadband and try and get two broadbands and go with an SD-WAN solution, which I thought was a perfect fit for us. Yeah, because that would get you a lot more bandwidth over the old 1900 solution as well. Plus, and just more bandwidth solves all problems for capacity, I think. And the rate that we're growing, it's easier to deploy as well. I can have these things uh, pre-configured. I can send them yeah. out, we use, we use remote hands, get these things up and running real quick. I'm not waiting for circuits to be installed, <laughs> for the router guy to come, take his coffee break, you know, the whole old world mentality of telecom yeah just getting standard off the shelf broadband internet connections is it turns up in a few days or a few you know maybe a week or two whereas the old mpls would be like provision checks and blah 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 you know then something would be wrong and it'd have to reprovision and it would be could be months before you got it in so just a saving right there for for growth in the business Absolutely. I'm also guessing with 60 locations or 60 plus, you don't have people, IT people on site at every location. So having something you can just essentially direct someone to walk through to plugging it in is probably better for you. Exactly. We're centralized in the sense that our our corporate location is in Long Island, New York, and we use remote hand services all across the country. Different states, we have different different, uh, people that we go to to help us out. Mm -hmm. And for the last two years, it's been working out real great. So you hinted at something there a minute ago uh, that you were pre-provisioning the Fortinet SD-WAN devices. Does that mean they're being pre-provisioned at the factory and then just shipping directly to site? Um, we're trying to get to that point. That's that's a very exciting proposition there. I might take mm. you up on that. But what we are doing is using Forta Manager, and Forta Manager is centralized in our data center, and through the public IP that the device gets at the location, it communicates back to Forta Manager, encrypted and secure. And configurations right. can be standardized across the board. I can push the same policy all across the nation. That that policy is a is a real security fence. We'll talk about that more down the line a little bit. But that's sure. so it's that you take the box out on site, you plug it in, it registers, calls home to the Fortinet uh, SD manager, and then it knows what where, where the device is and it's ready to go basically minutes later, sort of thing. Exactly. There's a template that we have for the locations. And that's what we apply. And now we're standard across the board. Maybe it's a crazy thing, but us network guys like to do things the same over and over and over and over again. <laughs> so that when we support it, we know exactly what's happening. So what are the key applications that you have to support over the WAN? Well, voice is a big one. So the incoming number for those locations are uh, local numbers to the state that we're in. So voice is a big, big concern. We want to, we want to be able to answer that phone for somebody mm-hmm. who's in an urgent care type situation. We have an EMR, electronic medical record right. application. Yeah. That's also hosted in the cloud. Uh, there's a common theme here. It's all cloud. Our email <laughs> is cloud as well. We try to, de- you know, I don't want servers to fail that will cause issues across the nation. A lot of people think it's risky, but I believe it's getting to a point where it's much more mature than the early days. And the Microsoft platform combined with the Fortinet platform makes me feel real real confident in, in the solutions that we've chosen. Okay, so you're talking about UCAS uh, for your voice? 
Uh, yes, we use a centralized cloud. Uh, it's Ring Central. They are omnipresent, I guess. Uh, yeah. If you're in California, I, I don't know how that auto, auto magic works in the cloud and the Ring Central design. <laughs> but for me, because of the Fortinet and the way the policy can be pushed to those devices, internet is going out locally, mm -hmm. right? Which I think is a big deal. Because if you're doing location type services, when you go to Google or whatever type of search that you're doing, you don't want to funnel all your traffic from all these locations mm. into a data center and then out, out to the internet. Right. A lot of the SD-WAN solutions I've worked with in the past, that's exactly what they would do. They would VPN or encrypt the traffic all inclusively back to a centralized data center and then out to the internet from there. And when you're nationwide, if I'm in California and I go to check the weather and it's showing me Secaucus, New Jersey's uh, temperature, <laughs> that's not really going to work. Well, it's also because those um, the, a lot of the SaaS services actually have pops all over the country or all over the world. Yes. And you don't want to be trunking your traffic from, you know, the left side of some country to the right side just exactly. to access that you want to be using their pops. They've already put that infrastructure in place. So it makes sense to break out as quickly as possible. So that was but, the, big, the big win or big draw for me or one of anyway. But it's always yeah. a security issue then because you're actually sort of, once you break out locally, you're using some visibility and control. But you said before that you have a standard policy. What about visibility? You're getting visibility from the solution? Absolutely. I can see everything that everyone's doing at, at all times. The 40 manager is tied in with something called 40 analyzer. Mm -hmm. And the all the devices out across the nation sync their logs up to 40 analyzer. Now it's important to realize that when I push the policy out to that firewall, it's dumping the traffic locally, but the firewall policy is acting locally. So mm -hmm. the same security policy I have in California is the same in Chicago, is the same in New York, uniform across the board. Without having to backhaul it back to a central location either. Yes. And when you're doing voice and, and critical things like that, you don't you don't really want to do that, well, especially uh high load. Yeah, what situation. normally happens is the router config and location A gets different from the one in B and the one in C and somebody doesn't clean up the rules and then once they're changed, you can't make the change because you don't know you might break it. And this whole one policy everywhere dramatically changes the security policy in real life, I think. Yes. I mean you do have to in, in the way that we treat it because of, of the changes that we made universally back in 20 or starting in 2018 hmm. we allow the same things at every location and the other side of this too is that a lot of those policy rules are actually application aware they're not ip address this ip address that it's application this application that absolutely that's that's another key uh attraction to the fortinet product it is application aware so hmm. in healthcare we have things that we have to protect patient information uh -huh. hmm. so we want we don't want to allow things like dropbox or Google Drive or any of the public type uh, in infrastructure, just because we don't want data from inside leaking into those mechanisms, right? So the Fortinet allows me to do that, and it allows me to do that standardized across the country. So you mentioned voice is a critical application. You also mentioned not being on um, a, a regular circuit, like an MPLS circuit. So a lot of folks shy away from that because they worry if I'm just putting my voice traffic across a public internet connection, maybe the experience isn't going to be so great. What has your experience been like or your end user experience been like running voice over SD-WAN and the public internet? So I've had the fortunate experience of trying it two ways. We, before we went to the cloud service, we tried. Fortune? Fortune? <laughs> is that what you call it? Yeah. Um, using the NEC product that we had, which worked out pretty well. We just had some vendor issues. We were good in New York, but as we moved east, the support thinned out and a lot of product, a lot of problems with things that shouldn't be. So while the voice quality through the SD-WAN over the internet through an SBC in, in our data center worked flawlessly, we had a relationship with bandwidth.com and we accepted uh, two to 500 trunks from that service. It worked great, but feature wise and analytic wise and all these other things that are important to large organizations wasn't really there. And to get that level of expertise, I would say, required a lot more than we could get from our current vendor. Mm. So, so this the is the cloud. old NEC sort of key systems where there's like 16, 32 handsets in a system and they've got this arcane programming language and these custom interfaces. And most of those people sort of don't actually know how to spell IP. They do not. And they're, yeah. very, they're either afraid of it or they just don't want to use it. 
And <laughs> when your support guy <laughs> types in star six seven two four five on a phone, and, and you don't know what that does, it's actually triggering something in the local PBX. <laughs> I, I I need to be able to support over a hundred locations with a small staff. Cost is always a factor. Right. Mm -hmm. Moving it to the cloud was the best thing we could have done. Yeah. Well, I think it's it's not just cost; it's simplicity. You know where you're at, um, and that actually ends up saving you money. It's cost isn't the reason that when we prepped for this call, you didn't say I needed to save money. What you said was I just need to do it better, and that's what you've ended up with here is by kicking out the NECs and replacing it with a SaaS service. The voice calls didn't change much, but you've got visibility and you've got a lot less complexity. Absolutely. So what about impact on day-to-day operations? Does having SD-WAN in place make any difference for things like, well, we mentioned visibility. What about troubleshooting, change management, that kind of thing? So we use remote remote access software that flows through the SD-WAN to get to the locations. So if somebody does have an issue at a PC, one of my support team can remote into that device and view the same desktop uh, that the person is using and and. We actually extended that to our application support people. So people are having issues with the EMR, they can get help. And that remote desktop can be viewed pretty much anywhere uh, securely. And we know who's doing it uh, across the country. And the feedback from that has been fantastic. How so? Like who, who's, whose feedback has been good? Is it the administrators or the end users? Well, the end users are for the most part because they, they are calling about a problem and trying to describe it over the phone. But when we say, oh, let me remote in and take a look at what you're doing, hmm. their, their initial shock goes, goes to joy when we show them how. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. To fix well, I mean, uh, the, the key here is that you're doing the remote access over the SD WAN. You're not coming over the internet via a back door or something, which is no. insecure. You're actually connected to the SD WAN, and then you're right there on their desktop taking control. And you've got the, and because of the way SD WAN works, more bandwidth and it's load balanced and it's costy, you're actually getting real time response. You're not sort of, yeah, it's if a combination I didn't, of this. Is, yeah. If I didn't tell you, or, and I had a support person come in here and, and I gave them the private IP of the device in California, they wouldn't know the difference. They would uh-huh. they would have thought we had private circuits or MPLS or any, any of the uh, the various things. It's it's really robust and it, it's high performing. Uh, there is no, I have no regrets. But you're also <laughs> running through an encrypted tunnel, which is important because you're dealing with sensitive information. In many ways... That's a very key point. I think that's even better than the older circuits and even the MPLS. A lot of that was unencrypted. So our data was mm. traveling across those older platforms uh, you know, in a VLAN on a carrier switch, which if somebody went in the same VLAN, they could see our traffic. Mm-hmm. Now, now that's not possible. Yeah, I've been trying to tell people that for years, but they refuse to acknowledge that. Um, one last question that I wanted to ask you, you've got a roadmap about moving into the cloud. How is your Fortinet SD-WAN looking for getting onto, onto the cloud platforms? So the, the first thing I did when I got on board was build the data center that I could stick the Fortinet in and build my SD-WAN core. Mm. And as we move west and, and build more sites out there, there's I know there's going to be a need for a second data center. Our initial plans, because our voice core was in one data center, we wanted mm-hmm. to duplicate that core in the second one. I soon realized that I don't really need that second data center. I can use Azure. And the mm. exciting thing about it is the SD-WAN that I have in place today, I can add interfaces at each location in every state that rides the Microsoft network so, mm. and then goes back through into Azure uh, through that location where I have in Azure two virtual Fortinet appliances that are the receiving end of those tunnels as well. So in effect, if I lose my main data center, I've got VMs running in Azure that are domain controllers. I have our DFS sitting up there as well, which is a backup copy of the one in the data center. So in essence, I have created that second data center using Azure. And in many ways, I feel a better solution than the second data center. So this is taking advantage of Azure's VWAN integration. So the Fortinet SD-WAN integrates directly with the VWAN uh, feature that they've brought on recently. Absolutely. Um, right. And some of the side effects, if you want to call it that, that we've <laughs> noticed, which I think is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, there's, there's, I'll, I'll talk about the, the Microsoft side effect, and then I'll talk about the internet uh, side effect. Mm. But the Microsoft side effect was that We've noticed traffic preferring to go over the Microsoft VWAN connections on the Fortinet through the Microsoft National Network back to our VMs in the mm-hmm. in the Azure mm. portal. 
it's choosing that as a better path than the broadband internet uh, appearing to however it gets to our data center. Right, because Microsoft Coast. has built out this optimized backbone for themselves. So here we are able to leverage that for it's it's like having a national a national carrier, right? <laughs> along along with uh, the services that Azure provides. Very exciting and stuff. For, and for a business like yours, that is uniquely a feature that you could never get unless you were a much larger company. You're literally getting features and functions that it would normally be for a much larger. Um, organization to be able to access, I think. Absolutely. And coming from those organizations and, and, and knowing what we want and to see this available through Azure, it's, it's going to transform the landscape. Mm. Um, John, I guess one final issue I wanted to ask you, because ultimately you're a healthcare provider and COVID must have had an impact on the business. Did that change the, your Fortinet SD-WAN implementation in any way? I was very confident in having it because we got hit uh, traffic in multiple ways, right? Okay. People that were normally in the corporate office are now working from home mm. and they needed to access resources on, on the network. So there, there were more remote users than ever before. We had more Zoom meetings, which was you know, basically 16, 20, 25 people on a Zoom call, video and audio, no, no care in the world for the poor network guy that has to make sure all this stuff works. <laughs> so they would max out you know, HD or 4K video across the network. Um, our EMR had to keep working and our voice calls. The amount of people that came in for testing for their children and for their family and first responders, which we offered to do, which is something for pediatrics that would never be done. Mm. We wanted to make sure that we were helping our communities. The There was never one instance where we had a, a, an internet outage related to firewalls or, or what the Fortinet product was doing. There were some local outages with uh, carriers. We lost our, our WAN 1 connection, but because the Fortinet has that good old WAN 2 on the interfaces, the traffic se- seamlessly switched over to WAN 2 and ran mm-hmm. from there, unnoticeable to uh, the, the crew at, at large. Mm. And then it was only you had to run around and fix it, but you weren't too panicked because it, everything was still working. Yeah. Let's just say I was a little concerned, but not panicked. <laughs> never, never, guys, never panic. <laughs> well, that does wrap it up. If folks are interested in learning more about Fortinet, they can just head on over to Fortinet.com. That's Fortinet.com. John, thank you for joining us, and thanks to Fortinet for being a sponsor. Sponsors make it possible for us to produce a whole slate of nerdy IT podcasts. Speaking of which, you can find this and many more fine free technical podcasts along with our community blog at PacketPushers.net. You can follow us on Twitter. That's at PacketPushers. Find us on LinkedIn and rate us on Apple Podcasts. And last but not least, remember that too much networking would never be enough.